On one day each year, the 25th day of April, Australians and New Zealanders throughout the world gather to pay tribute to comrades and countrymen who fell in battle 50 years ago. In every city, in every town and hamlet throughout the two countries, the men of two world wars march in Anzac Day ceremonies. To the people of Australia and New Zealand, and to the men who fought the Battle of Gallipoli 50 years ago, Anzac, a military failure, means more than any major victory. The tradition has been with us now for 50 years, remembered proudly as a symbol of nationhood, a pivotal event in history, a hallowed point in time. When war broke out in 1914, Australia, originally a group of crown colonies, had been a single nation for barely 14 years. Britain's conflict on the other side of the world made a powerful emotional appeal to the Australian people. A citizen's army was formed and named the Australian Imperial Force, the AIF, and volunteers were called to fill its ranks. They came in their thousands, then hundreds of thousands, the pull of kinship strong from every part of the country where men had trod. There were young men, often in their teens, high-spirited, keen-eyed, eager for the battles ahead. For most of them, battling would be no new experience, for they and their fathers had tamed a harsh, unyielding land, which had fought them for every gain. They had fought drought and bushfires in the long, hot summers, floods and devastation on the coastal plains. They had coaxed and fought the land to submission, forced it to yield good crops, to graze good herds and flocks. They had watered it with their sweat and nourished it with their life's blood until their feet were planted strong. In the course of a century, they had bred a new breed of men. They were taller than their fathers had been, long-limbed and lazily able-bodied with strong physical reserves, men of resource, initiative and resolution. Peaceable men they were, yet they had qualities both natural and acquired which were to make them soldiers whom history would salute. Australia had promised Britain a force of 20,000 men equipped and fully maintained to serve anywhere on earth. Every man was a volunteer. They bore no grudges, had no historic or traditional enemies, 
but took up arms to bear their share, to meet an obligation which they accepted as part of their British heritage. We had to wait in Albany for the New Zealand contingent to come over. They arrived in 11 transports. The first excitement we had was the Emden episode, when the Sydney sank the Emden off Cocos Island. She wasn't far away from our co convoy either. Actually, we could hear the firing. As far as the transports was concerned, it, it, life was fairly dull. The, you know, day after day, all these ships were all in line and drilling all the time. You had to do your drill all the time. The two outstanding things were the Melbourne Cup, the result of the Melbourne Cup and the, the sinking of the Emden. The first contingents were bound for the Western Front and the battlefields of Europe. But when Turkey entered the war on the German side, their destination was changed to Egypt. We were dumped off in Egypt to complete our training there. We'd only had two months in Australia. They established camp on the edge of the desert, close by the pyramids. And there, under a single command, were formed into the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, and identified by their initials, ANZAC. Of course, we had a look at the pyramids and the Sphinx. There was even a bit of leave in Cairo. But we had a serious job to do, to fit ourselves to fight a tough and well-trained enemy. Conditions there were, were hard, but you can't, it's no use. You can't make a soldier out of mollycoddling him. You've got to be used to hard training. You've got to be able to live off the land. As soldiers, the Australians and New Zealanders of the Anzac Corps were an unknown quantity, for their next battle was to be their first. Astride the sea route from the Mediterranean to the Black Sea, controlling a valuable potential supply line from the British to their hard-pressed Russian allies, lay the Turkish Empire. It was here, in a region old in war, that fate was to nominate the Anzac's initial battleground, where Christians and Muslims who barely knew of each other's existence were to fight for the waterway through the Dardanelles. In the early spring of 1915, the country folk of Turkey, like country folk everywhere, were astir with the stirring season. The flocks were again brought up from the winter pastures. The soil was again turned for the new generation of crops. The new year moved to an age-old pattern. Though all men of military age had been conscripted for army service, the Gallipoli Peninsula seemed a long way from war. The beaches at Garba Tipi, at Hellas and Suvla Bay, and the steep sloped hills that ran with razored edges to the Aegean Sea were quiet now. But this was the spring that was once again to bring war to a simple land. The new blossom heralded more than one harvest for the peninsula. Attempting to force the Narrows, to break through the Dardanelles and into the Black Sea, the British Navy in March 1915 fought to defeat Turkey by a naval assault alone. The attempt was a failure. 
And the Navy, unable to overcome the mines and shore batteries of the Turks, eventually withdrew. Turkey remained unconquered. Its armies and its people, now forewarned, stirred to passionate temper. With a fierce energy and religious patriotism, they prepared for the land assault they now knew to be inevitable. Ottoman troops moved down the peninsula to stand guard at beaches and landing points. At Garba Tepe, the lookouts watched and waited for the infidel who would come from across the sea. The first amphibious assault in modern war was scheduled to take place on the morning of Sunday, April 25. The invasion fleet, British, French, Indian and Anzac, moved in under cover of darkness. In the pre-dawn, the first troops prepared for the landing on Turkish soil. A spirit of adventure rode with the young Anzacs, for they were not yet familiar with the smell of death that was later to foul the morning air. The advantage was with the Turks, but the Anzacs, after leaving the cover of the beaches, clawed their way up the steep cliffs and gained a foothold in the hills. The world read of their exploits. How some of the forward scouts fought their way inland to look down on the narrows, the object of the attack, a prize which was never to be closer than it was for a fleeting moment on that first blood-soaked day. Along the vital waterway lay Chenacoli, Gallipoli, and other tiny ancient towns. These were to remain only names to the Anzacs during the eight months that followed their landing. The townships of the Dardanelles were never to be seen by the invaders. Neither these, nor the glittering prize of Constantinople, the guardian of the Bosphorus and the Black Sea, were ever to be theirs. The Anzacs were never to walk the streets of this proud city, or to hear the muezzin calling from the minarets of the Blue Mosque.
They were never to see the Christian mosaics which stood in a Muslim world and which for years had been hidden from the Turks themselves by the Ottoman rulers. They were never to stride as victors through a land where enemy armies had marched for a thousand years. To the south of Constantinople, clinging to the beachhead and their precarious footholds in the hills, the Anzacs fought on. From April to December, through summer, autumn and into winter, when they were finally to be evacuated, they held to their pitiful handful of earth. In the frontline trenches, sometimes only yards apart, a strange camaraderie developed between the enemies, a camaraderie based on mutual respect. But the battle was never less than bitter and was still to cost both nations the flower of their manhood. Today, the sound of gunfire has long since died away. Memorials stand where once brave men fought hand to hand. And names that are now part of history are carved in stone. And the graves of those who fell on Anzac Hills are tended by the people whom they fought. Ten thousand Anzacs lie forever at Anzac Cove. At Quinn's and Chanuk Bear, at Russell's Top, the Neck and Lone Pine, where seven Victoria Crosses were won in a single action, the only sounds today are the sounds of spring, the 50th since the gunfire ceased to ring. The trenches have fallen in the grass is green, and only the graves and stone memorials remind us today of what this land has seen. Anzac was the first great battleground for the men from the sister dominions. By their efforts here was the world to know them and their new nations. In the years that followed, the initial force of 20,000 strong was to grow to 417,000 before the war was won. Of these, more than 61,000 were never to return. The Anzacs were to fight in every field of conflict, to win honors and great victories. But it was here, at Gallipoli, on the beaches and in the hills, here where the battle was lost, that they gained their immortality.
In Turkish hills that fall sheer to a tranquil sea, men untried, unblooded, proved their worth and manhood. And in Australia, 10,000 miles away, a group of states, federated by decree, found that they were, in fact, a nation. In one single heroic enterprise, the Anzacs completed the unification that federation had begun. Henceforth, the Australians were one people, welded by a common cause. And on the Gallipoli Peninsula, the Anzacs became one with the mainstream of history. For across the Dardanelles lies Troy, where men of another age had also proved their worth. To the ancient stories of Trojan, Greek and Roman legend, a new chapter had been added. In an ancient land, men of today tend the memorials of two and a half thousand years ago, or of 50. The history of humanity has been one of struggle and death, and through it, honored as men and as nations, have marched the long columns of heroes. The Anzacs of Gallipoli have merged with the columns and become part of the history of mankind. It is a precious thing for a nation to possess its own heroes, men who have fought nobly in a great cause. For Australia and New Zealand, the Anzacs were such men. Today and always, for their heroism and their gift to us of nationhood, we will remember them.